أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين من يهده الله فلا مدل له من يدلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to us in the Qur'an and tells us uh, a lot about the kinds of questions that we ask as human beings. All human beings wonder about these types of questions, hopefully at some point in their journey through this life. And those are questions about, first of all, where we came from, and second of all, what our purpose is, and third of all, where are we going? Where are we going to go after we leave this life? There are few things that are certainties that people rather there are few things that people accept as certainties that people cannot argue about and one of those things is the fact that we were born at one point nobody can argue that that those people who are on this earth were born at one point and secondly that every individual will die at one point that everybody no matter whether they are Christian or Jewish or atheist or agnostic or or worship, you know, the fire. They all cannot deny the fact that one day every single person will die. This is a certainty. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran about these things, about the fact that what is going to happen after we die, and specifically, and, and what we really need to focus on also is what are we supposed to be doing while we're still here. Because the bottom line is that once we do die, at that point, we can't, we can't act anymore. At the time of death, there's no more that we can do. And so one of the things that the Prophet ﷺ actually advised us to do is to remember death. And so when things, you know, when, when someone close to us does pass away, it should serve as a reminder for ourselves as well. We miss the person who's passed away. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy on that person. But we also need to take it as a reminder for our own selves. Because we also are going to be going to that same place. You see, that person who passed away, they, um, they're not going to a different place than we. They just got there before us. So you have to think about this journey. We're all in a caravan. We're all going to the same place. But some people are ahead and some people are behind. And we happen to be behind, but we don't know when we're going to get there. But we are all going to the same place that this person went to. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy on her and to have mercy on us when we get there. But the thing is with us, unlike those who have gone ahead, is that we still have time to act. We still have time to turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one who has passed away doesn't have that chance anymore. And there's only three things that will continue to benefit that person in their grave, even after they pass away. The Prophet ﷺ said that those three things, one of them is a righteous child who prays for them. So the child who, of this person who prays for them and prays that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mercy on them, that that is one of the things that can continue to benefit you even in your grave. Secondly, is some sort of knowledge that you give to someone or that you spread that continues to benefit people even after you die. And third is a sadaqa jariya, which means a, a sadaqa, a charity that continues to benefit. So for example, if someone spends money to, to, to help a school or, some, or a masjid, build a masjid, this is something that continues to help and benefit people through your charity. But other than those things, there is no more chance for that person to do what we have a chance to do. And so while we should come together and remember the person who's passed away and ask for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy on that person, we also need to remember our own selves. And we also need to look at what are we preparing for that day. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us when He addresses the believers and He says, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله والتنظر نفس ما قدمت لغد واتقوا الله First Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the believers and says, O oh, you who have believed, have taqwa of Allah. 
the first advice in this ayah is have taqwa of Allah. Have fear of Allah. Have consciousness of Allah. Know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always watching you and have this and protect yourself from his anger. Protect yourself from his wrath. Have taqwa. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, let every person look at what he has put forth for tomorrow. You know how in our lives we, we tend to plan for the future, right? We plan for what am I going to do tonight? What am I going to do tomorrow? What am I going to do next week? What am I going to do next year? And we plan, you know, we, we, we plan. If we're in school, we plan what are we going to do after we graduate? When we graduate, what am I going to do once I get a job? You know, if we're parents, what am I going to do when my child is this age or that age? We, we make lots of plans. But Allah here is reminding us to look at what we're putting forth for, for the other tomorrow. Not just the tomorrow that's, you know, tomorrow as in the next day, but the tomorrow that comes after this life. Because you have to think of the hereafter as like, is like a house, okay? And what you're doing is you're in a house now, and you're going to a different house. Can anybody argue with that? No. We're in one house now, and we're going to a different house. Now there is furniture. Think about this. There's furniture and there's provision in each house. And so the question is this. Once you get to that other house, how furnished is it going to be? How much, how much food are you going to have in the fridge? How much drink are you going to have? Or are you going to be starving when you get there? Are you going to be without any furniture, without anything? Because you haven't put anything in that house for when you go there. And that's the point is that what have you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking us and reminding us in fact to, to, to pay attention to what it is that we're putting forth in that house. Because if you think about the one who lives only for this life, he's like the person who knows he's going to that other house, but goes ahead and takes all the furniture and all the food from that house and puts it in the house that he's leaving. Right? We're, 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 we're leaving this house. And the one who only lives for dunya is taking out the furniture, out the food, out the drink from that house and filling it in the house he's leaving. It's, it's a very irrational decision because that person is leaving this house. Why is he taking the furniture from the one he's going to? He should be doing the other way around. He should be furnishing from, from this house for that one. Because that's the final abode. And there's something else very important here that Allah reminds us again and again in the Quran about. And that's that this house is temporary. This house is temporary. No matter how much we try to distract ourselves, you cannot escape the fact that it's temporary. Every single person is going to die at some point. And so... The other house, the other life is not temporary. That's the life that lasts. And that's the life where we never, we never die at that point. And so the question here is who is going to trade something that's temporary for something that's forever? Even if you think about it from a business point of view, it's a very foolish trade. Right? From something that is, is limited. And, and not just is it limited. But it's imperfect. It's actually quite painful at times, right? This is dunya, right? Dunya is a place where you have to feel sadness sometimes. You have to feel scared sometimes. You, you cannot avoid crying, bleeding. All of these things are part of dunya. At the same time, it's limited. It ends. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the hereafter, or He describes rather Jannah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes it in a few ways. One of the ways Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes Jannah is He says, Khairun wa abqa. Khairun means that it's better. And abqa means it's longer lasting. So on two levels, it's better than this life. It's better in quality and it's better in quantity. Khairun, it's better in quality. Meaning that in that life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Jannah, لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون. There is no fear on them, nor shall they grieve. So these, both these emotions which torture us in this life, right? the two emotions that torture us most in this life, if you study abnormal psychology, you find that it's basically depression and some form of anxiety. It's, it's sadness and it's fear. And these are the two things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says there is none of in Jannah. لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحسنون. There's none of the fear that torture us in this life and torture people. Like people need to take medication because of their fear. It's, it's a serious problem. The anxiety that tortures human beings in this dunya. And they need to take 
they need to take medication, they need to drink, they need to take drugs, they need to do things to escape this anxiety and this fear. In Jannah, there's none of that. And the second is, 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 the, is the sorrow, is the sadness. There's none of that either. That there's, there, there's no sorrow on them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that Jannah, khayrun, better in quality, wa abqa. Abqa meaning that it is better and long, in that it's longer lasting. This life, no matter what you try to do to hold on, it always comes to an end. And there are lessons and signs throughout the universe to teach us this and remind us of this. One example Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us is like a garden. You know how if you, you know, some people in this room may have an appreciation for flowers, right? Flowers are beautiful, especially roses. But, you know, when you get a rose, it's so beautiful for how long? How long, is that be how long does that rose last? The rose is beautiful, but it's beautiful for a few days. If you're lucky and you really take great care of it, maybe a few weeks, right? But then what happens to that rose? The rose, first it starts to wilt, and then it starts to become dry, and then eventually you can take that rose and those beautiful petals and crumble them in your hand. Just go like this, and it becomes nothing. And if you're outside in the wind, it just gets taken by the wind. This is what happens to that thing that used to be so beautiful. And by the way, that is a metaphor for this life. And I'm not making, I'm not making that metaphor. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains and describes and compares this life to a garden. In Surah Al-Hadid, that this is the example Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives. That it's just like this garden, and the garden is beautiful, and it makes the, the farmer very happy for a while. But then what happens over time is it crumbles away. And there's only one, and there's only two things that, that are left after it crumbles away. And those two things are either Jannah or Jahannam, wa'udhu billah. Those are the only two things that are left after everything crumbles away. Why do we have this reminder again and again in the Quran? Why am, why, you know, why am I talking about this now? Why do we need to think about this? Because a lot of people would rather not think about this. A lot of people try to escape even any, any reminder of death, right? Because it's like depressing. Like people consider it depressing. But it shouldn't be depressing. Because I'm telling you and Allah, Allah is telling you that that house is better. <laughs> that house is bigger. That house is better. Mm -hmm that house lasts forever, why would you be attached to the lesser one? Why would you? I mean, you wouldn't if I told you, you know, there's this shack, right? And then there's this mansion, and that's not even a proper comparison because Jannah is not just a mansion, it's, it's, it's something infinite, right? A mansion is still limited. But you get my point. You're not going to be attached to the shack when you could have the mansion. And that's just a mansion and a shack. This is talking about something which is limited, just something that... That after, you know, Allah tells us that after we wake up from this life, this, dream, this life is kind of like a dream. After you wake up from this life, and people are going to ask each other, how long were you in that life? And people say, yawman aw ba'd yawm, a day or part of a day. It, when we look back at this life, once we wake up from it, we look back at this life and say, it felt like a day or part of a day. You know how when you're dreaming about something, like you're in the dream and it feels really real? Right? Mm -hmm. And it feels almost as if it's lasting forever. Am I right? But then what happens when you wake up? When you wake up, you look back and say, oh, it, it was nothing. It wasn't even really real. But at the time, did it feel real? Mm -hmm. Exactly like this life. At the time, it feels real. But once you wake up from this life, you look back, it just seems like a day or part of a day. And the only thing that's going to matter is in what state you're in once you wake up. In what state did you bring your heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That's your job right now. Is to, is to work on your heart. Is to work on this relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and to do the work to put that furniture in that house. So that when you get there, you have something to live off of. You know? And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us in this, in this journey because... We can't do it without him. Like if we just try to depend on ourselves or even rather depend on our deeds alone, we, we can't do it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, tells us even his prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that no person will enter Jannah by his deeds alone. That every person enters Jannah by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And when they asked him, the companions asked him, even you, O Rasulullah? And he said, yes, even me. So think about that for a second. If the Prophet ﷺ will only enter Jannah by the mercy of Allah, what about us? Like, can we ever, our deeds can never outweigh his deeds. And yet, even his deeds were, even he will not enter Jannah except by the mercy of Allah. So what we have to do is seek the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the dead and also for us, for the living. We need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help in this journey. And I want to inshallah remind you and myself of this, that a lot of times people think, and this is sort of the way that we Muslims uh, might delude ourselves, that we can live our lives however we want. And the only thing that we need to do is just say a small little statement before we die, right? Just say la ilaha illallah before you die, right? It's as if it's, you know, um, this easy thing to do. And you live however you want, you, you live your whole life, and all that really matters to you is dunya, right? All that matters to you is fashion, all that matters to you is do I look nice, am I thin, what is this person doing, what's that person saying? You know, how big is my house? How nice is my car? These are the things that I, you know, that if you spend your life and that's all you cared about, then, and you think then at death, you just say, La ilaha illallah and you're good. And by the way, this is also an issue. This is also a problem. Is we sometimes think the only, the only thing we have to worry about is the big sins. As long as I'm not drinking, I'm not clubbing, I don't have a boyfriend, I'm okay. But I might be living my entire life completely consumed with dunya, even the halal part of dunya, right? My house is halal for me, right? My clothes are halal. I can wear brand name clothes. I can have a Mercedes. I can have a BMW. Are any of these things haram? No, these are all halal. But if that's all I live for, that's all I care about. All I care about is what this person is saying, what this person thinks, what this person did, and that's all I live for, then that is, that is, Oh, that is just as dangerous as living, you know, my life, drinking, clubbing, whatever, because the point is, I'm still distant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even though I not, might not be committing these big sins, my entire life is revolving around something other than Allah. In fact, my entire life is revolving around dunya. And the people in dunya, and the fashion of dunya, and the, you know, the... Um, the brand names and the, and the image. What, what's my image in front of people? What are they going to think of me? What are they going to say about me? This is my obsession. This is my focus. And I honestly could care less. What does Allah think of me? Right? I want to dress a certain... I'm afraid to wear hijab because of what's this person going to say. Or I want to dress a certain way because I want to be attractive to this person. This is what consumes us. These are the priorities that we have. And yet what happens is at the time of death, we think that we can say la ilaha illallah and we're good, right? But the problem is that at the time of death, our tongue will only be able to speak what's in the heart. So if I didn't have la ilaha illallah in my heart, my entire life, or in my life, right? At some point before my death, if I didn't live la ilaha illallah, I can't say it. And we know, and all of you probably know of stories where people cannot say it at the time of death, right? You've heard these stories. Somebody is telling them, say la ilaha illallah, say la ilaha illallah, and they can't get themselves to say it. This statement is only given to the person and have the ability to say it with your tongue if it's what's in your heart. The same way we know in the grave, when we're asked in the grave, who is your Lord, right? What is your deen? And about the Prophet wasallam that even if I called myself Muslim in this life and I didn't really believe it or I didn't really live for it, I, I won't know the answer in the grave. That's scary that I'm going to say I don't know. And it's the same thing at death. If you don't carry la ilaha illallah, you don't live la ilaha illallah, you can't say la ilaha illallah that easily at death. And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we can live la ilaha illallah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our focus and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our priority, and we're furnishing that life, because that's the house we're going to, and this is the house we're leaving. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم إنه غفور رحيم سبحانك الله وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خصف إلا الذين آمنوا معمن الصالحات وتواصل الحق وتواصل السر السر
Yeah. Okay. So one of the things um, I think we have to do is not necessarily like we we view. I think we view our task as so, sort of like a to-do list, right? So we have a to-do list of okay, I have to do this, this, and this before I die. You know, it's like it's like I think we sometimes when we do want to focus on on that journey or that struggle, that's kind of how we think of it. Uh, and I think what we have to do is move away from the to-do list and focus on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I know that, I mean, I don't know if this is very conceptual, but basically um, we, when we focus on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and building our relationship with Allah, all the to-do things become just like, more like second nature. Does that make sense? If we, if we have a close relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we're, and, we're, and we're close to Him and we're able to build that relationship, then the things that we want to do will become a lot easier. So one hadith actually that talks about this is a hadith where it says that there are no actions which are more that that make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala love us as much as those things which he has made obligatory. So it's kind of like this hadith creates like a like a plan. The first thing that's said is that the thing that makes us most like gets that the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will love most for us to do are the things which are fard, the things which are obligatory. So this means our five prayers. This means fasting Ramadan. This means Zakah, Hajj, right? These are the, the Fara'id. And then the servant continues, he says, the servant continues to get close to me by adding the extra things, the Nawafid, now the supererogatory things. This is now talking about the Sunnah prayers, the, you know, the Qiyam, the Tahajj, the, the, the Sadaqah, the extra uh, fasts, the extra charity, the extra remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the things that you want to add. And then the servant continues through those things after the fara'id, continues with those things until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves that servant. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves a servant, Allah becomes his hearing with which he hears, his eyes with which he sees, his hand with which he strikes, and his feet with which he walks. And if he were to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something, he would surely give it to him. And if he were to seek forgiveness, he would surely forgive him. So in this hadith Qudsi, it gives you basically a blueprint of what, of what you need to be doing. First of all, we need to focus on our fara'id. So we should not minimize the importance of the five prayers, the five daily prayers. If those things are minimized, then it's going to be, I mean, we can't possibly, you know, basically progress in our path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if those things are not in order our five prayers our zakah our, our Ramadan if there's days that we need to make up for Ramadan we need to make them up like those are the things we need to focus on and then and then after that we can set out time and I know you were asking about you know how do we do that in our busy life uh, we can set out time even if it's just a few minutes a day where we are alone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's extremely important. So if you have kids, you have family, you, you need to find a time, again, even if it's a few minutes, where you, it's just you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it's a time of remembrance. You are either praying, or you're reading Quran, or you're making dua, or you're praying qiyam, whatever you are doing. And the key is also consistency. Because the Prophet sallallahu said that an action which is small, but consistent, is more beloved to Allah than an action which is really big but inconsistent. And it does less for you. I mean, I, I give this example because we can understand in the physical world that if you want to get in shape and you're like, okay, you're really pumped, you want to get in shape, you want to lose weight, so you go to the gym for eight hours straight. I don't even know if that's possible, but suppose it is, right? Somebody does that. So you, you go there for eight hours straight, but then you don't go to the gym again for like six months. So <laughs> what's that going to do for you? It's not going to do anything for your body, right? It's the same thing with the heart. That you have to, it has to be consistently being fed. You know, the same way we have to eat three times a day. You can't just eat once a week and expect to be all right. You have to eat 
three times a day. You have to eat regularly for your body to be alive. The same thing, you need that food for your heart regularly for your heart to be alive. And the food for the heart is the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So my, the answer to your question, I think, is that we need to be consistent. We need to focus first on the fara'it. And secondly, you know, adding the extra things. And even if they're small, be consistent. Because even if a thing is small and you choose one, one path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to stick on this thing, maybe your thing is, is dhikr, is, is like the, the um, morning, you know, there's morning, morning of God, right? Morning supplications and evening supplications. Suppose you choose that and you stick to it and you do it every single day and you do it um, consciously, like, like actually with your heart present. And in addition to your fara'id and you stick to that, that that inshallah will have a big effect, that will have an effect. It's like taking a, a vitamin, right? You can't just take it every other day or once in a while, like the way I take vitamins, <laughs> you know? Like, you have to be consistent for it to have an effect. Mm -hmm. Similarly, same thing with medicine. You're an, if you're on an antibiotic and you don't take it regularly, what happens? You guys all know this, right? If you don't take the whole course and you take it every day, you're not going to get rid of your, your bacterial infection. And in fact, it might come back stronger because now it's antibiotic resistant and all that kind of problem, right? So the idea here is that it's the same thing. We ha it has to be consistent medicine. Allah says that the Quran is a shifa, is a healing. But in order for it to have its effect, it has to be taken regularly, even in small doses. Okay, so again, the idea here, it doesn't have to be something big, but it should be consistent. And it needs to be every day, and, and you need time alone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, and if that means that you wake up a few minutes before Fajr to pray Qiyam, it is well worth it. It is, it is well worth it. Yeah. It, it kind of goes along with Shania's question with the whole um, doing the deed throughout your day. Yeah. Now, uh, once you have a, a, you have a husband and then you have your child and then you have multiple kids or, you know, like she said, you get so wrapped up in your schedule, you know, you wake up, you cook, you feed the, the, you know, the child, you clean, you get everything done and you're, you're praying your five prayers and, uh, you know, you're getting those things done. But by the end of the day, you're so wrapped up in all of your duties that you don't get time. To, you don't get a chance to take out that extra time. Mm -hmm. Now, in those uh, actions that you're doing, like for your husband, for your child, are you still getting the other? You know, mm -hmm. is it still counting towards even if you're not taking that time out to sit down and yes. you know pray extra yes. or uh, you know read extra Quran or something like that? But if you're you know praying your five prayers and. Uh, Maybe like nursing your baby, your feet while you're feeding your child, or while you're cooking for your husband, or while you know you're doing these things yeah. for your family. Yeah. How is that, yeah. you know, counting towards? That's a really good family? question. So, just to repeat your question. Her question is that, as a mother, as a wife, you have these certain duties. So, are you being? I mean, suppose you may not be praying during that time. Maybe I'd be reading Quran, but are you being rewarded for those things that you're doing for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala? And that's a really good question. And the answer. I think is, is it, depends on, it depends on your intention. Um, but you remember the hadith I just talked about where I said that you start with the fara'id and then you do the extra things and then you get to a point where something amazing happens and that is that Allah loves you, that, that Allah loves the servant. And what happens once Allah loves the servant? Once Allah loves the servant, something really, really amazing happens and that is that he, Allah, becomes his hearing with which he hears, his sight with which he sees, his hand with which he strikes, his feet with which he walks. So think about this hadith for a second. Even those things that he's doing, right? Seeing, hearing, using his hand, using his feet, these are all for Allah. In fact, they, are, they, become, they become a reflection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you are in a place with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then after that, you take care of your kid, it's a reflection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You, you're cooking, it's a reflection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, my, I, my biggest thing is, and I'm sure a lot of new moms that are, you know, yeah. or even not new moms, you know, you kind of feel like before you were married, before you had your kids, you had this routine, you had this connection with Allah, and then now you get so busy and yeah. everything. How do you, uh, how you, do you feel yeah. like you've lost that connection? Yeah. So yeah. how do you know that it's still there? Hey, maybe I'm not reading as much Quran as I used to, yeah. but Allah, me and Allah are still here. Yeah. You know, how, do you, yeah. how do you just feel that? Well, okay, that's, a, that's an awesome question. Um, what, 
you know, there's a reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that in your spouses and in your children is a fitna, mm. is, a, is, a, is a test, is a test. The reason why these things can be tests is because one, they can serve as distractions. Mm -hmm. Two, they can compete with your love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. okay? So inside of the heart, uh, it may be that I say I love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala most, but in fact, I love my children most. Or I love my husband most. And these are subtle. This is subtle. This isn't something I'm ever going to like say with my tongue, hopefully, right? Mm -hmm. But it is something that is, is, it's there. It's in the heart. Okay? So, 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 so that's why, that's why it can be a test for you, a fitna for you. Here's the struggle. The struggle is once you get married and you have kids, it is very easy. And in fact, this is what almost always happens. That my focus mm -hmm. goes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to this. Mm -hmm. My focus goes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to this. It goes to my husband. It goes to my children. It goes to cooking and cleaning. And basically, this isn't to say there's, that there's, this, this is something that I do. And this is something that is noble. But I'm talking right now about focus. I'm talking about where is my heart, not where are my actions. The heart, it moves, it shifts. And what the, the heart is facing and what the heart is focused on is no longer really Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's this gift that Allah has given me. And what happens with us is we fall in love with the gifts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we forget Allah. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the gift of money, for example, we fall in love with the money and we forget Allah. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us children, we fall in love with the children and we forget Allah. And what I mean by that, again, we still, of course we're supposed to love our children, we're supposed to love our spouses, our, you know, our parents, all these things. But I'm talking now about where is my focus and where is my, like, um, really like, what am I actually living for? And we come to a point, and this is the test, where I'm actually living for my children. That is what I'm living for. I, I do my obligation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but even while I'm doing that, I'm thinking about my kid. Mm -hmm. I'm praying, I'm thinking about my kid. Yeah. Am I right? Mm -hmm. I wake up in the morning, I'm thinking about my kid. I go to sleep, I'm and thinking about my you kid. Have it wrong, right? Yes, you have it wrong. Mm -hmm. You have it wrong. Because I, did, I was not put on this earth to think about my kid. Mm -hmm. I, I was put on this earth to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And my child, alhamdulillah, is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I cannot hold that gift in my heart. I have to have the gifts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in my hand. My dependency, what I'm living for, should only be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a means to get to Him. For sure, motherhood, by all means, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's prophet says that heaven is at the feet of mothers. And that when the man was asked, who is, you know, who should, is most worthy of my kind treatment? He said, your mother, your mother, your mother three times and then your father. We know that this is a means to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it cannot be our, what we live for, because then we've made it into an end and not just a means. So, you know, um, when I talk about attachments, and, and, and we, when we try to figure out what are the attachments that are keeping us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or, you know, they serve as barriers between us and Allah, the way you can try to figure out what, are our, what is your attachment, one of the questions you can ask yourself what do I think about all day long? <laughs> what is consuming my thoughts? What's the first thing I think about in the morning? What's the last thing I think about before I sleep? What keeps me up at night? What keeps me from being able to eat? What makes me cry? You know, what, what makes me most happy? Basically, what am I obsessed with? <laughs> and usually, it's something other than Allah. And that is an indication for me that my attachments are wrong. Do you guys do you understand what I'm saying? This doesn't mean that you don't love these things. It means I don't live for these things. I live for Allah. And when my focus is correct, and my focus is on Allah, all of these things just become vehicles to bring me closer to Him, instead of being barriers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Got it. Good, and alhamdulillah. You have an article, something like that. One of, about the gift, the gift. Yeah, one is about the attachment. The, the attachment. Yeah. 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 Attachment. And one attachment. of the ones that one of the ones I have recently is called for the love of the gift, and it talks about this issue, where when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gives us a gift, and we take that gift, 
And gifts, if you think about gifts, where does somebody hold a gift? In their hand, right? A gift, you hand me a gift. First of all, a gift is something that doesn't belong to me. It's something that, that was given to me, but it doesn't belong to me, right? So I have this gift, it's in my hand. If you take it out of my hand, it might scrape my hand, it will hurt maybe, but I don't fall down and die at that point. Do you feel me? But if I take that gift and I inject it into my heart, so now this gift isn't just in my hand anymore, it's what I live for, it's what I, it's what I would die for, it's what I depend upon, and I cannot live without it. In fact, my, my whole life revolves around it. And this is what we do with Allah's gifts. We do it with people, we do it with our families, we do it with our husbands, we do it with our children, we do it with money, we do it with beauty, we do it with status, we do it with wealth, all of these things. These are things that we put in our hearts. Even, again, these are halal things. We put them in our hearts. Now we're living for that thing. And so what happens now is if that thing is taken away from us, which it will be, because everything is taken at some point, that's when we bleed. So then the, the idea here is that the pain associated with something taken out of the heart, an, an attachment being taken, and something that was taken out of the hand is completely different pain. One makes you sad, naturally, you know, you're sad when you lose somebody. But the other, if you were dependent upon that thing, if that thing was in, it was a, an attachment in that sense, and once that is lost, this is when we talk about complete devastation. This is like the Romeo and Juliet, you know, like now I have no reason to live because I lost my object of attachment. And this, this does happen to people, right? They lose the, all their, their fortune. What do they do? Suicide. Commit suicide. Does that not happen? They, they, somebody that they love dumps them or dies or doesn't want to be with them or divorces them. They go kill them and themselves. Does this not happen? Crimes of passion are very common. I mean, somewhat common, right? And one of the most common like, causes of murder Right? The idea is that I, I w this was an object of attachment. This wasn't just a gift. You know, I didn't, I didn't just have it in my hand. And sometimes one other, one example I thought was really striking was I had looked up, I was looking up like reasons why people kill themselves, like in the news. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I found that there were a couple stories, especially in India, I don't know why, um, where, where women were, well, one, one woman, was she, this I guess was happening, she killed herself because she wasn't able to have a child. So she was, I guess, married for 19 years, and she wasn't able to have a child. And while this is something, obviously, a huge test, and, a, and, and something that would make one very, you know, I mean, it's, it's a test. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, blesses us with our children. But because she couldn't have a child, she killed herself. So you see how something can be, when something is an attachment, where, where it's that important, this is what I'm living for, my to have a child and my child, that once that I can't have that, I have no more reason to exist, that's a serious problem. Yeah, so. So, I'm sorry if someone else has a question, but I have one more, last one. Um, so, what, I mean, do you have any, like, tips on, say, you know, somebody, you do, yes, you feel like, okay, this is me, I'm totally attached to something, and I need to just kind of reevaluate and kind of step back. Do you just have any, like, any tips or any advice? I mean, I know it's like a really yeah. general thing, How do you but, yeah. uh, you know, just something small you can do that will kind of bring you back a little okay. bit. Even if it's something first, small. Yeah, okay. So first thing, so how do you break your attachment once you realize you have one? First thing is realizing that you have it. Uh, when you start to, re like, you know, the first, um, before you can cure something, you have to be able to diagnose it. So realizing that I have this, Wait a minute, I am, there is this thing, and it is actually a barrier between me and Allah because I'm too attached to it. And my focus is on this thing instead of Allah. You realize that, then you're halfway there. That's, that's a big step, because this is something hidden. And what's really difficult is that usually these attachments, especially for practicing Muslims, are hidden within the halal. These are all halal things, my children and my husband and my, my money and my wealth. All this stuff is halal. So that's why it's hard to see. If you see it, alhamdulillah, that's a big part of it. I think this, the second thing that needs to happen, I think two things. One is that, like you said, you take a step back. And part of, you know, I said that we need time alone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Where, let me give you an example. The salah, five times a day, 
This is something Allah designed. Five times a day, what do I do? I'm cooking, I'm cleaning, I'm at the mall, I'm in a party, no matter where I am, no matter what condition I'm in, I have to pull away from that and go and pray. What is, what is Allah doing here? I'm pulling away from basically dunya and I'm refocusing on my actual purpose. Mm -hmm. And it happens how many times? Not once, not twice, five. Mm -hmm. And they're spread out. It's, it's, like a, it's like a prescription to help me not get too attached. If I, if I ignore that, I put it aside, that's why I get so engrossed. Mm -hmm. You see? Mm -hmm. So that's, part of it is taking time out. Is pulling, taking time out where I'm reorienting, refocusing. Okay, wait, this is where, this is actually my purpose. And you know, so part of the problem is when we go a long time without remembering Allah. We have company that doesn't remind us of Allah. We have company, all they talk about is dunya. This is um, a poison for the heart. Because it makes you forget about your actual purpose. Nothing is reminding you. And especially you're not praying. So the problem is not to go a long time without remembering Allah. And not re reminding yourself your actual purpose. Reminding yourself that you're going to die. Reminding yourself. It's... It's like if you just think of yourself as like, okay, your head starts to go this way, look at this thing, look at that thing, you're refocusing. So time, pull out to refocus. The second thing I want to say is this. Can you imagine that if you can see a mansion, would you be really interested in playing with a dollhouse? No. If you can see a throne, are you going to be interested in this toy chair? The more we can see and know Allah, and the more that we can see and know the hereafter and know Jannah, the smaller this life looks. It's just a natural consequence. So the more that we build our relationship with Allah and we, we know who Allah is and what Allah has saved for us, naturally we will be less impressed mm -hmm. with whatever we got, whatever is around here in dunya. You see? Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like if you think of a cup and the heart is like a, like a cup, like a vessel. And if that cup is so full of all these, you know, attachments to dunya, all these concerns of dunya, there just isn't space for Allah. So the heart is just too full. So you kind of have to empty it out first. Mm -hmm. Similarly, if the heart is so full of Allah, there's no space for all these other false attachments. Yeah. You feel me? So mm -hmm. it's like the more you can build your strong connection with Allah, the more you can see Allah, the less space and the smaller other things look like. Mm -hmm. And um, what would you do if, if it was the other way around? Like if um, someone was attached to you, mm. like a family member or your kids or something, yeah. like how would you approach that situation? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, that, that, that's almost harder. <laughs> um, well, the first thing that comes to my mind is make a lot of du'a <laughs> for them. Um, and, uh, you know, it's hard because it's like you can't do it for another person. Yeah. All you can do is you make du'a for them and then you try to, uh, you know, you, you can try to tell them. You can try to talk to them. You can try to sort of slowly pull away, you know, in the sense of, um, so that they're not so dependent on you. Or rather, you want to try to direct them, redirect them to towards what they really need to be dependent upon. But ultimately, sometimes, I mean, again, you can't do it for a person, um, but sometimes it's just, it's, it takes uh, some painful experiences, disappointment, you know, being let down by your object of attachment in order to detach, unfortunately. I mean, it's kind of like, you don't want to do it on purpose, you know, let somebody down. No, like, no, no, you no. Yourself no, but it will happen inevitably. That's what I'm trying to explain yeah. to you. Mm -hmm. If somebody, it's not like you need to do it on purpose. You're, it's like this, it's like this. You're a human being, okay? A human being, this example that, I, I've written about this example, that if you are, um, someone's climbing a cliff, right? And they hold on to a twig. What's going to happen? Their whole weight their entire weight is holding on to this twig, what's going to happen to the twig? It's going to break. Is it the twig's fault? If the, tw if the twig tried really, really hard not to break, is it going to keep from breaking? No. It's, it's not intended to, to hold that weight. Somebody is, has an improper attachment to you or is dependent upon you, no matter what you do, no matter what you do, they'll be let down because 
you're you're not created to be an ilah. Yeah, if you understand what I'm saying, it's, you don't have to be a mean person to let them down. It's because that's not your job description. That's only Allah who can play that part. Mm-hmm. Um, so should we not put him in extracurricular activities where it does, like let's say we're constantly driving around, we're mm-hmm. like taxis, we're driving here, we're driving there, yeah. they have this and they have that. <laughs> should we just limit <laughs> that? Yeah, yeah. That way we're <laughs> Well, you know what? Um, so she's asking about extracurricular activities because you end up being like, you're describing like the soccer mom, right? Like you're <laughs> driving around everywhere. You can, um, again, if your focus is right, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can help you to facilitate these things. I mean, assuming they're not getting in the way of your ibadah, um, you can maybe still use that time. Like say, um, I mean, it's still possible, like say while they're at the extracurricular, extracurricular activity you can use that time to read you can use that time to you know do dhikr like you know do tasbih well i mean oh you mean salah times okay okay i'm glad you bring that up i'm glad, I'm glad you bring that up you you can find a corner to pray i mean you don't need you i mean you can pray on the grass i mean you can pray the you you if you're if your salah, this is, I'm glad you bring this up, because if your salah is being um, compromised so that your kid can go to soccer practice, then definitely there's a problem. It means that, yeah, your priorities need to be, you know, shifted. What really, again, it's a mindset where this is my priority and this is a not, like, my salah, my relationship with Allah is a non-negotiable. It is a priority. And I'm not going to just leave it when I have time. Okay? Everything else can happen when I have time. You know? So this is the thing. So what you do is, again, I think it's a mindset. It doesn't mean you can't do those other activities for your kids. But it means you have to have your priorities set. And I'm going to pray when I need to pray. I'm not going to put it off. Because that means that you're putting off your purpose of existence so that, you know, your kid can learn to play soccer. And that's a serious problem, obviously. Um, yeah. So could you, like, you know, you know that while they're in practice, it's time for prayer. Or before, can you just play in the car? I mean, is that something that you're well, cutting it short? You know, yeah, like, I don't, I don't, I don't think, I mean, it's different scholars. Yeah, I wouldn't pray in, I mean, you can usually find a pra- place to pray properly. Mm-hmm. You know, cut it, I, praying in the car, it's, it sometimes might just be a, like a cop. Like, you know, it's just like the... Eh, I'll, just, I'll just do it. I'll just get it over with. You know. Well, I mean, of course, anytime your life is in danger, I mean, you could, you could even eat pork if you're starving. I mean, that's not the point. I'm talking about regular situation. Um, most situations, you are safe to pray. I mean, most most situations. I mean, even you're at the mall, you can pray in a fitting room. You know, um, you can always usually find a place to pray. The the question is, is it a priority? Because if I make it, if I make it like, oh, it's okay, then I'm always going to be not doing it, or I'll be praying in the car or whatever. But if I make it a priority, you'll usually, I mean, again, you can just, you can pray on the sidewalk. I mean, you can, you, if you, if it's a priority, you will do what you have to do. If you really see it that way, you know what I mean? I mean, we, I guess the take-home message is we need to see our relationship with Allah and our ibadah and our salah as like a life or death situation, like that serious. Definitely making dua and just asking Allah for help, you know. Um, That's this, true. This uh, Friday's khutbah, Brother Hassan did the khutbah in Corona Masjid, oh. and he had done, um, there was a dua that he was talking about, and of course I can't remember, but it's just bringing a lot to you. You know, you just ask Allah for help, and mm-hmm. no matter what, I mean, it's the sincerity. I mean, sidq, he was talking about sidq, it's how truthful you are. Mm-hmm. I mean, you were there, right? The, for no, the wait, no, I wasn't there. Oh, okay. Okay. So he was talking about how truthful you are. I mean, so you want to do all of these things. Really? Mm-hmm. Do you want to do yeah, these things? Yeah, you know, cause yeah. Because if you want to do things, then you will make the time yeah. to do it. But how important it yeah. is, you know, I mean, yeah. is it the soccer practice point. or whatever it is. Yeah. But if you want to pray, yeah. oh, Allah, please, and if you're making dua, yeah. you know, 
make my heart truthful. and and Allah sees the truthfulness the, the in the heart in, intention yeah and the yeah. intention and so Allah will make a way for you too to if you have that truthfulness yeah. so the question here you see you make that sincere strong desire like I want to wear hijab or I I am not going to miss a single prayer and you make that sincere like you have sidq with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know truthfulness then you will see it inshallah happen but you have to have that